For those of you that are visiting us and just checking us out, you, you came at a great time. We're starting a new book here. And as you can see, we're going to be doing an introduction to the Old Testament book of Joshua this morning. But let me go ahead and, uh, and just begin this morning with a prayer, a word of prayer. Uh, Heavenly Father, we are, we're so thankful that you brought us here. You have us all here right now, Lord. It is a blessing to be able to, to fellowship with one another, to sing praises to you, to worship you, and to be reminded how far you've brought us, Lord. That you've, for many of us, you brought us from the, out from the pit of, of all pits, Lord, and, and you rescued us and saved us, and we're forever thankful for what you've done, what you provided for us. It's humbling, Lord, to, to remember and to think, to know, to realize how much, how much you really do care for us and love us. So now as we begin this new book and this new, um, from your word, I pray that you will bless it, Lord. Bless this introduction that I will be sharing, that you help me to prepare. And uh, yes, Lord, even with this introduction, we know that you still can change lives, you still change hearts, Lord, and, and we pray that you do that this morning. We pray for those watching and listening too, Lord, that you will um, also change their lives. It will, that the word will go out powerfully and it will just be the seed of your word will be implanted deeply into their hearts so that, again, it just will be forever transformed. Keep us safe this morning, Lord, and just bless us. Bless this room, Lord. Fill us with your spirit. We pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, well, some of you may be wondering why anybody, anybody should be studying the book of Joshua today. An ancient book that gives a grim account of war, slaughter and conquest. Well, if the book of Joshua were fiction, we might accept it as an exciting adventure story. But the book conveys real history and is part of the inspired Holy Scriptures. Now, reading it can be, frankly, a jarring experience especially if someone has only been exposed to the Bible by either hearing the gospel from someone else, reading just the New Testament, or listening to mostly New Testament sermons. Why? Why can it be a jarring experience? Because the New Testament, it doesn't really adequately prepare anybody, the listeners, the readers, it doesn't prepare them adequately to read the stories found in the pages of Joshua. Those stories about a time and a world of military violence and, yes, ethnic cleansing. They may begin to have some serious, troubling questions about God's attitude towards his created peoples. Questions with no easy answer. But as difficult and challenging as the book of Joshua presents itself, it asks readers to let it tell its story from its point of view and out of its ancient context. It asks them to give it the benefit of the doubt and permit it to speak to them. And yet, also, the book of Joshua is far more than its battles. There's never a good war or a bad peace, Benjamin Franklin wrote in 1783. But it's possible that the wise old patriot was wrong for once. Beyond its battles, the book of Joshua is far more interested in the land of Canaan, whose possessions was the goal of 
the conflicts. And so to do this, God called Joshua to be the general, to be a general and lead the army of Israel into in holy conquest. There were bigger issues involved in that, con- in that conquest than the invasion and possession of a land. Issues that touch our lives, that touch your lives and our faith today. And these issues are, we'll be covering several of them, a lot of them uh, as we go through this book, but this is why I've decided that to spend the next few months covering this great and amazing Old Testament book. The book of Joshua is the book of new beginnings for the people of God. And many believers today need a new beginning. You see, after 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, Israel claimed their inheritance and enjoyed the blessings of the land that God had prepared for them as the days of heaven upon the earth. That's, my friends, is the kind of life God wants wants us to experience today. Jesus Christ, our Joshua, wants to lead us into conquest now and share with us all the treasures of his wonderful inheritance. He has blessed us with all spiritual blessings, Ephesians 1.3 says. But too often, too often, yes, we live like defeated beggars. Thus, I really believe that the message of Joshua can and will encourage and have a wonderful impact in our lives. For those of you who want this, for those of you who want the message of Joshua to positively influence your life for God, the following four words are offered as food for thought. First word, thirst. The psalmist wrote in Psalm 42, verses 1 and 2, As a deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, O oh God, my soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go meet with God? Sadly, men too often seek to fill the void in their souls with things that never truly satisfy. See, we're all created with a void. All of us were created with a void that only God himself can satisfy. If you're watching, you're sitting here, you're listening to this, and you know that void, you felt that void, there's, there's a big hole in your heart that you've tried to fill with so many different things. Just know that everybody has that hole, and that hole isn't filled until the Holy Spirit makes his home in you, until you surrender your life to Jesus Christ. See, the psalmist recognized this, and after the, anolo- after the analogy of the deer thirsting for water, spoke of the thirst in his soul that only God could feel. But then there was a question, when can I go meet with God? Church, fellow believer, a good time and a place that we can do that is here in church and also in our personal Bible study time. I've discovered, and maybe you as well, that out of a thirst to know God, those are the most effective times. And so, again, as we go through this book, I pray and I hope that the book of Joshua will do that for you. The second word, toil. In our fast foods, mall-oriented society where we expect everything to be quick and easy, we often approach our 
Bible study time in the same way. See, effective, effective Bible study is hard work and requires diligence as anything worthwhile if we want to accomplish much. It says in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, be diligent to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who doesn't need to be ashamed, correctly teaching the word of truth. Third, time. You can heat a cup of water in a microwave in a minute and quickly mix a tablespoon or a favorite instant coffee or tea or hot chocolate, whatever it may be, and have something hot to drink. But the greatest blessing usually comes from meditating, reading, and spending time in God's precious book. Fourthly, teachableness. Again, in a world full of man's ideas, theologies, ideologies, and philosophies, we will get the most when we come to Scripture with a teachable spirit, asking God to teach us His truth. Not our truth, not what we want to read, read into it, but His truth, what He wants to tell us. You see, for it's His truth, and only His truth, that sanctifies and sets us free. So as we read and go over Joshua, hopefully with your Bible in hand, may these four T's, thirst, toil, time, teachableness, teachableness be in your mind and in your heart. So as I, next week, as I go through Joshua chapter by chapter and verse by verse, I, again, I hope that you have those things in mind. So if this is your first time with us, if you haven't really joined us when we start a new book, what I normally do is I, do a, a, I try to do with the time we have a, a good thorough introduction of every book that I begin. I'm not a... I'm not the kind of pastor or teacher that just does a really short introduction and gets right into the book. I think there's a lot that needs to be said, explained about the origins of the book, the history of the book, what's going on during the time, um, and why it's important to us today. So that's what I'm going to be spending time with. And as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, I will be going through several passages with you all. Um, and uh, if you want, if you can... Uh, feel free to write these down, and, and, uh, or if not, I'll, I'll just share them with you afterwards. But that's what we'll be doing this morning. So let's look into some basic information about this book of, this Old Testament book of Joshua. The title, the author, and the date the book was written. The title of the book bears the name of its leading figure, Joshua. Now, his name and the title of the book mean Yahweh, means Yahweh saves or Yahweh is salvation. The title, therefore, suitably describes what, uh, what God used Joshua to do as recorded in this book. Namely, to save his people by conquering Canaan and apportioning it to Israel as their promised homeland authorship who wrote the book now while the book is anonymous the ancient ancient tradition is that it's largely by Joshua himself completed after his death by Eleazar the high priest and son of Phineas Joshua contains vivid material suggesting that the author was an eyewitness there are also pages in the first person that's another clue there also, the book specifically records that Joshua had some documents written. The fact that Rahab was still alive 
In chapter 6, verse 25, at the time of the composition, fits well with Joshua being the main author. So when was Joshua written? The date of Joshua is partly dependent on the date of the Exodus. The facts bit, fit better with the early, more conservative date of the mid-1400s B.C., a date for Joshua between 1400 and 1350 B.C. seems likely for the following reasons. The book has to be earlier than Solomon and also before his father David. Now, since Joshua chapter 13 verses 4 through 6 calls the Phoenicians, Sidians, Sidonians, it must be before the 1100s B.C. when Tyre subjugated Sidon and before 1200 B.C. because the Philistines invaded Palestine after that time. Yet, they're not a problem in Joshua's time. Let me now give you a quick overview of the book. The book of Joshua describes the conquest and possession of the land of Canaan and may be divided into three single or three simple divisions. The invasion or the entrance, conquest, and, number th or, and third, possession or division of the land. This is the land God had promised Israel through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So here, God fulfilled that promise. He came through, though not, though not uh, exhaustively, since there still, remains, there still remains a rest for his people. Joshua describes the military triumph of God's people through faith and obedience. However, unlike most military histories, in the book of Joshua, the focus is on the commander's commander. That's the focus, the commander's commander, the captain of the Lord's host. Repeatedly, as Joshua, Joshua's name illustrates, Yahweh saves, the book demonstrates that Israel's victories were due to God's power and intervention. So what has happened thus far in the previous books prior to Joshua? I won't go into an exhaustive you know, study or, uh, of each book. I'll just quickly name some big things that happened. In Genesis, Israel was born as a nation in the call and and promises of God to Abraham, so that we see the, the birth of Israel. In Exodus, the nation was delivered out of bondage in Egypt, crossed the Red Sea, and was given God's holy law. In Leviticus, the nation was taught how to worship in view of God's holiness. In Numbers, they were tested and numbered as a nation. And then in Deuteronomy, the law was reviewed and reiterated and closed with the assurance that Israel would possess the land. So what are some of the themes and purpose, and purpose of this book? The theme is the venture and victory of faith. The venture and victory of faith. As an, as an historical account, the book of Joshua demonstrates the faithfulness, not of Joshua or people or anybody else, but the faithfulness of God. Despite the inconsistent nature of the faith of God's people, it shows him as the covenant-keeping God. The purpose of the book of Joshua is to give an official account of the historical fulfillment of the Lord's promise to the, patriarch, to the patriarchs to give Israel the land 
of Canaan by holy war. Now, a holy war, just to be clear, was a conflict with religious overtones, rather one with political motivation of defense or expansion. And this can be seen in the opening charge, chapter, two, uh, chapter 1, verses 2 to 6, and the concluding summary at the end in chapter 21. Specifically, the conquest of Canaan under Joshua's leadership was based on the Abrahamic covenant. God, having dealt with all nations, made Abraham the center of his purpose, the center of his purposes, and determined to reach the lost world through Abraham's seed. According to Genesis 12, the Lord made a contract or a covenant with Abraham, promising him unconditionally to give a land, a po posterity, and spiritual blessing to the patriarch and his descendants. And soon thereafter, God said he was giving the land of Israel forever, and the boundaries of the land were then given to Abraham in Genesis chapter 15. Later, God affirmed that the rightful heirs of the promised land were Isaac and his descendants. Thus, the book of Joshua records the fulfillment of the patriarchal promise as Israel appropriated the land pledged to her by her faithful God centuries before. Now, the fact that the nation was later dispossessed it doesn't reflect on the character of God. Not at all. Rather, it reflects on the fickleness of the people who took the divine blessings for granted, fell into the worship of their neighbor's gods. As a result, the nation came under chastisement by God and the chastisement that God had warned them about. But Israel must possess the land forever according to the promise. Something that awaits the return of Messiah and the redemption of Israel. According to the prophet Isaiah, the Messiah will be the second Joshua who will restore the land and reassign its desolate inheritance, inheritances. In the New Testament, Paul taught that the events of the Exodus and the conquest are meaningful for Christians in that those events possess significance as types. The Greek form of the name Joshua, Yahweh saves again, or Yahweh, uh, Yahweh salvation, is Jesus. As Joshua led Israel into victory over her enemies and into possession of the promised land, and as he interceded for the nation, after it had sinned and had been defeated, guess what? So does Jesus. He brings the people of God into the promised rest, intercedes for his own continually, and enables them to defeat their enemies. So now let's look at some of the pictures and typologies in Joshua. As you can see by what I've already covered, what I've already mentioned, Joshua is a book rich in pictures for the believer today. It's rich in analogies. And this is supported by Hebrews chapter 3, verse 7, and all the way to chapter 4, verse 12, and also 1 Corinthians chapter 10. The book of Joshua portrays the faith rest life of a believer today 
who experiences the blessings of his or her salvation through a faith that overcomes the various trials, temptations, and difficulties of life that he or she faces from our three enemies. What are those three enemies? The world, the flesh, and the devil. Let me share with you some some analogies that are found here. Though we are to appropriate our salvation and put it to work, what I mean by that is discipline ourselves unto godliness. In Christ, we do not work for our salvation or for our spirituality, but are to rest by faith in what God has already done for us. To rest by faith in what God has already done for us. Being in Christ is our faith. I mean, is our place of rest. Forms the basis for rest over our enemies in this life. And it also looks forward to a millennial and eternal rest. In Christ, we're blessed with every spiritual blessing. Church, this is our reward. reward. In the world, we face enemies and struggles. But in Christ, we are promised victory through faith and endurance. Joshua, the leader of the people of Israel, is a type of Christ, the captain of our salvation. The crossing of the Jordan is a picture of a Christian reckoning on his death and resurrection with Christ and moving into a place of growth and victory. The conquests of Canaan portray the Christian's conflict with the enemies of the world, the flesh, and the devil. Taking Jericho pictures victory over the the satanic world system that stands walled up against our spiritual progress. Those spiritual forces that are trying to keep you from maturing, from growing, to becoming more like Christ. The defeat and then victory in AI illustrates our struggle with and deliverance over the sinful nature or our propensity to to sin or to seek the Christian life in our own strength. The deception and experience with the Gibeonites illustrates our battle with Satan and his demonic deceptions. Now let me again remind you that these are some of the stories, these are some of the topics that we're going to be covering as we go through this book. So as you can see, over and over and over again, God's word faces us with our need of deliverance, which comes only from God. Here we're faced with the absolute necessity of the saving life of Christ. Christ is the life and the only life which saves. Without his death, giving us justified standing with God and without him and his life within, all we have is man working from the source of his own weakness or temperament, attempting to be Mr. or Mrs. Nice Guy, nice girl, attempting to conform himself or herself to some cultural or religious standard. My friends, this isn't authentic Christianity. It's counterfeit, a distortion, and a deception. 
It's a trick from Satan designed to move people away from God's solution in and through Christ and in the light of his authoritative word, the Bible. Satan wants to blind us to the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. Who is the image of God? And what, does the gospel, and what is the gospel of the glory of Christ? It's the saving life of Christ. It's the saving life of Christ. The fact that man is saved and delivered from himself, from himself, by the glorious life and work of Jesus Christ, who is the very image of God. We're never to be the source of our Christianity. Its source is Christ and Him alone. We're never to control our Christianity, but Christianity and all that is ours through Christ is to control us. We're not, we're not to try to reprodu reproduce the image of God in us. Instead, Christianity is God producing Himself in us through His Son, Jesus Christ, by the power of His Spirit. So throughout this book, I will share I'll be sharing spiritual truths or principles from the text of Joshua. We will also seek to illustrate a number of parallels or analogies to the Christian life. The justification for doing this is found in passages like Luke chapter 24, verse 27, where it says, Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he, speaking of Jesus, interpreted for them the things concerning himself and the scriptures, as well as 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4, 6, and 11. Verse 4, and all that drank the same, and all, and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they all drank from the spiritual rock that followed them. And that rock was Christ. You see, the rock spoke of the presence and work of Christ. Verse 6, Now these things took place as examples for us, so that we will not desire evil things as they did. Then verse 11, These things happened to them as examples, and they were written for our instruction on whom the ends of the ages have come. These verses teach us that these Old Testament events, they were historical events that manifested the saving work of God in the life of ancient Israel. Again, this book, this book of Joshua, it's going to point to Christ. It's going to point to Jesus like every other book in the Old Testament. But they also provide principles, pictures, and illustrations that form warnings and teach us truth practical to a believer's life in Christ today. They form fascinating and instructive parallels and analogies to the believer's life. If you're a believer here today, then you, then you will see this as we go through this book. It will, again, fascinating parallels and analogies in Christ as you face a hostile and contrary world. Egypt. Egypt portrays the world with all, with all its human ideas, idolatries, mysticism and antagonism to the salvation, deliverance, and purposes of God for his people. Being in Egypt, being in Egypt portrays the lost condition, a slave to Satan, the world, 
and the flesh. Coming out of Egypt through the Passover lamb and the Red Sea portrays deliverance by the death of Jesus Christ and the mighty power of God alone. It speaks of redemption through the saving life of Christ. A believer going down into Egypt, like Abraham in, in Genesis chapter 12, pictures a believer turning to the world and its substitutions and solutions rather than turning to the Lord for help, for deliverance. Israel in the wilderness is a type or a picture of the believer in carnality. Someone living a Christian backslidden and now living for the pleasures of their, of their flesh. He or she is redeemed and blessed with marvelous privileges, yet fails to go on in his or her life with God and is living outside the place of maximum blessing out of the will of God and in constant defeat, wandering about because of failure to trust the Lord and the, del the deliverance He has promised. Crossing the Jordan and moving into Canaan is a type or picture of the believer possessing his or her possessions by faith in the power and provision of God. It portrays the believer in fellowship, faced with conflict and enemies, yet able to be delivered and dependent upon the Lord and walking by faith in the principles and promises of the word. The Canaanites in the land portray the believer's enemies who stand to oppose us in the Christian way of life, but who are at the same time a defeated foe, though we must appropriate our God-given victory, the saving life of Christ. Some believe that Jericho may illustrate the world. Achan, or Achan and Ai, the flesh or the sinful nature. And the Gibeonites may illustrate the deceptions of Satan and the world system. Now, I want to begin closing here because we are going to have communion afterwards. But I want to begin closing by just saying that the leading person in the book of Joshua it isn't Joshua, no, but the Lord Jehovah, the God of Joshua and Israel. In all that Joshua did by faith, he desired, his deep desire was to glorify the Lord. When the Jews crossed the Jordan River, Joshua reminded them that the living God was among them and would overcome their enemies. Through Israel's obedience, Joshua wanted all the people of the earth to know the Lord and to fear him. In his farewell address to the leaders in chapter 23 and to the nation in chapter 24, Joshua gave God all the glory for what Israel had accomplished under his leadership. At least 14 times in this book, God is called the Lord God of Israel. Everything, everything that Israel did brought either glory or disgrace to the name of their God. When Israel obeyed by faith, God kept his promises and worked on their behalf. And God was glorified. But when they dis disobeyed, in unbelief, God abandoned them to their own ways. Think about what I just said. He didn't abandon them. He just 
abandoned them to their own ways, and they were humiliated in defeat. Well, the same spiritual principle, the same spiritual principle applies to the church today, to us today, those of us that are Christians, believers, born-again believers. As you look at your life and the life of the church, where you fellowship or where you call home, do you see yourself and your fellow believers wandering in the wilderness or conquering in the promised land? In the wilderness, the Jews were, complain were a complaining people, but in Canaan, they were a conquering people. In the, in the wilderness, Israel kept looking back, yearning for what they had in Egypt, in the promised land, they looked forward to conquering the enemy and claiming the rest and their riches. The wilderness march was an experience of delay, defeat, and death. But their experience in Canaan was one of life, power, and victory. So again, I ask you now, as you look at the spiritual map of your own Christian life, where are you living? Are you living still in Egypt? Or are you living in the promised land? If you're there, rest. Rest in Christ. you want to enter that rest if your whole entire life you've been struggling and these issues and problems I'm not saying that they would go they're going to go away but when you surrender your heart and your life to Jesus Christ he will give you a peace that goes beyond all understanding Find that rest that you've been looking for, that hole that you've been trying to fill in your heart with so many different things, drugs, alcohol, pornography, all these different addictions you filled. You know, again, I've mentioned many times in my story that I tried different things to fill this is before I became a Christian, to fill that hole that was in my heart. I even, there was a time I even dabbled in Wiccan witchcraft as a young teenager, thinking that that was going to satisfy. And then when that didn't, I moved on to, to pot and other drugs. And then I became a Christian, things were fine. And then I would join the Marines and again, it just, I was using that now as something to, as a substitute. And I fell away, I fell away for 10 full years. And now I started using alcohol to fill that hole, self-medicate, all these issues, all these things I wanted to get away from. mistreating my wife, my family. I was taking my job for granted. Everything I was doing was taking it for granted. But when I hit the bottom of my barrel, when I hit, when I reached the end of my rope, I had two choices, either continue in that lifestyle that I knew was eventually going to lead to my demise or surrender to Christ. A cry, Jesus, that I knew and had fellowship with and had felt his love, his grace and his mercy. And I was like, you know, I surrendered again. I rededicated my life and I, I didn't know where it was going to take me. I didn't know where I was going to go. I didn't know where, I knew there were still consequences that I had to face. I didn't know if I was still going to be married. I didn't know if I was still going to have my family. I didn't know if I was still going to have my job. 
But one thing I absolutely know without a sh- knew without a shadow of a doubt, I had Jesus. I had Jesus now, and that's all that mattered to me. I could have spent the rest of my life in solitary confinement in prison. I would have been satisfied because I had Jesus. And even to this day, I, I, I don't like to think about it, but even if I lost everything, as long as I keep my eyes on the cross, I know I'm still going to have Jesus. It was scary when I realized as a young man, when I realized the possibility that I was going to die and that I was going to possibly die, the likelihood of me dying alone was, you know, was very possible. That was scary. I don't like to be alone. Ask my wife. I always, I'm always asking her, hey, come hang out with me. You know, be with me. <laughs> She'll tell you. Again? <laughs> um, but, you know, I, even when my daughter leaves with her friends, what am I always telling you, Bella? I'm like, don't leave. You're leaving me again? You know? I don't like to be alone. But, again, in the end, I, I know Jesus will always be with me. I am the one who separates myself from him. Many of you know that. But maybe you don't. If you have separated yours, come back to him. He's not like maybe you've had a bad father, or a, you know, he, he's not going to refuse you and neglect you. God isn't, you know, he's a merciful, patient, and loving God, full of grace and mercy and love. You're his child, and he will always love you and accept you no matter how far you've walked away. Even if my, any of my three kids completely walked away from us and never wanted to have anything to do with us or we never heard from them, I'm always going to be there waiting and telling them and loving them how much I would be telling them how much I love them and, and be waiting for them to, to come back. That's how God feels. He's, he's waiting for you. Come back to that promised land, to that promised land and come back to that rest. And again, I want to talk now to those people watching that want to come into that rest, that want that peace that passes all understanding. I want to invite you to the cross. You can come and lay all your sins before the Lord, before, the, before Jesus, who died for all of them, past, present, and future sins. He will forgive you and will give you a new life. If you're ready to do that this morning, I want you to close your eyes and bow your head wherever you may be. Pray this with all your heart, with all sincerity. Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner and I ask for your forgiveness. I now believe that you died for my sins and rose from the dead. I now turn from my sins. I repent and confess you and you alone as my personal Lord and Savior. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for saving me. So now I ask you to fill me with the Holy Spirit so that he may help guide me and teach me in my new born again life. In your name, amen. Ladies and gentlemen, if you prayed that, reach out to us. We want to help you in your next steps. We want to hear your story. 
maybe help you find a new church if you can't if you don't know one or can't you know unsure about that if you want us to send you a bible we can send you a bible but reach out to us we want to know what's going on what's happening and maybe again help you but just know that right now there's a celebration in heaven because a new person has come to Jesus and has been saved. I hope that you have a great week. I also hope that you will join us next week as we will begin going chapter by chapter and verse by verse through the book of Joshua. It's going to be a great time. I know that you're going to learn some great things, and I know that I am as well. Um, and look forward to sharing with you the things that I've learned and hearing from you also things that you've learned as we as we go through this book. I'm going to try to get through it to the end to the end of the year, but we'll see. You know, again, I'm not any, I've never really been on any kind of time schedule. I know things come up, uh, holidays too, but you know, we'll just we'll go through it. Um, again, thank you so much for spending time out of your day, night, morning with us and um, bless someone uh, this week and you also be blessed. Thank you. Have a great day. We love you. Goodbye. Thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope you were blessed by Pastor Angel's message. For more information about Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, such as our service time or how to get connected, please visit our website at fvccelp.com. If the Lord is leading you to give to the ministry of Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, there's a PayPal link in the video description below. Once again, thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope to see you again soon.